One of the most important tools in signal processing are the Fourier transforms, which are used to represent time domain signals in terms of their spectral content. There are many different types of Fourier transforms, and the first one that you came across is probably the Fourier series, which is used to represent periodic continuous time signals in terms of their harmonics. The Fourier series can be generalized into the Fourier transform, which is used to represent arbitrary continuous time signals, not necessarily periodic. And the analog of the Fourier transform in the discrete time domain is the discrete time Fourier transform. And in a course on digital signal processing, the discrete time Fourier transform is arguably the most important. So before going into any new material, we'll cover the properties of the discrete time Fourier transform in somewhat more detail. So let's assume we have a discrete time signal x of n. So c here is the set of complex numbers, z is the set of integers, and we'll use square brackets to indicate that we're dealing with a discrete time signal and not a continuous time signal. So what the discrete time Fourier transform, transform says is that such a discrete time signal x of n can be built from simpler complex exponential e to the j2 pi nu, weighted together with a complex function x of nu and integrated in the interval 0 to 1. To get the particular function x of n, we know that these weights or these complex weights need to be given by the inner product between that signal and the conjugate of the complex exponentials. And this formula is what we typically refer to when we say the discrete time Fourier transform, and the above formula is typically referred as the inverse transform. So the inverse transform gives a representation of the signal x of n in terms of such complex sinusoids or complex exponentials. And just a note here, we'll use j as a uh, notation for the complex number. So there are several different properties which are derived more or less directly from the definition of the transform. So one, and probably the most important, is the linearity property, which states that if we have two signals, x of n and y of n, and the respective transforms are x of ni and y of ni, then if we make a linear sum or linear combination of the two signals, then the transform itself will simply be a linear combination or a linear sum of the respective transforms. Another property is the time shift property, which says that if we have a signal x of n with transform x of ni, and we shift that in time by an amount k, the effect that we'll have on the transform is simply as the multiplication with a complex exponential, where k appears in the exponent of that. Another property is the conjugate symmetry for real valued signals. So if we have a signal x of n which is real valued, and we take the transform, the transform will co be conjugate symmetric. And this will be seen when we plot the transform for real-valued signals, where we typically plot the absolute value only of the signal, and that will look symmetric. A fourth property is Parseval's relation, which states that the transform itself is energy-preserving. So if we have a signal x of n, and we take the absolute value squared and sum it up over all time, that will yield the same value as if we take the transform and take its absolute value squared and integrate it over this interval 0 to 1. So this is essentially a representation of the energy contained in the signal. Yet another property of the discrete time Fourier transform is that this function x of nu, or the set of weights, will always be uh, periodic with a period of 1. And this is easily seen based on the periodicity of these complex exponentials, namely that if we take an integer amount and add it to this normalized frequency, we can easily prove that this is equivalent to the complex exponential without this integer added. And that is what implies that if you take the transform shifted by an integer amount, work out what it becomes, this is equivalent to the transform itself for this normalized frequency nu. And this also has as a property or as a consequence that if we have a signal x of n and we want to represent it in terms of its discrete time Fourier transform, we don't actually have to integrate between 0 and 1 in the inverse transform, but we can integrate over an arbitrary interval of length 1. So the one, uh, the typical cases that you see is this integral though, that from 0 to 1 or in the integral from minus 1 half to 1 half. So let's consider an example. So look at the signal x of n, which is a ti uh, rectangle in time. So it's equal to 1, from n is equal to 0, to n minus 1, and 0 otherwise. So in this particular case, the discrete time Fourier transform is particularly easy to evaluate. So what 
we have to do is just sum over the values where x of m is equal to 1. So this term, which is nothing more than a geometric series, and we have an explicit formula for that. And if you work this formula, what you'll end up with is the following expression for x of nu. So when nu is not equal to an integer, it works out to be a ratio between sinusoids where the uh, uh, sinusoid in the numerator depends on the length of the original signal. And we also have a complex scalar shift in front of the signal, which depends on where in time we place this rectangle. So you can compare this to the time shift property that we covered uh, just a while ago. For the particular case when nu is equal to an integer, we have a 0 divided by 0, which doesn't really make sense. But in that case, you can work out explicitly what the transform is. And you see that if you put in nu is equal to an integer, what you have here is just 1. So it's the sum of 1s over n terms, so it's equal to n. So in order to get an understanding of what this looks like, let's see a plot of the signal or the absolute value of the transform for the case of n is equal to 6. So what you can clearly see, of course, is that the transform is periodic as expected. We also see that it consists of several lobes. We have one main lobe around the integer frequencies, and the maximum value of the transform is equal to n, which is 6 in this case. And we have a couple of different side lobes. So increasing the length from n equal to 6 to n equal to 8, we see that the transform itself increases. And this is generally a typ uh, typical behavior of the transform. As we make the signals longer in time, you will see that uh, the Fourier transform becomes less broad. And increasing length to 10 further this behavior for the transform. And in this particular case, uh, one can show that if one lets the length of the signal go to infinity, then the transform of the signal itself will become more and more like a Dirac pulse centered around the zero frequency and of course also the integer frequencies 1 and minus 1 and so on. And one particular signal that is very good to have a transform is the case when x is a pure sinusoid of some given normalized frequency nu zero. However, uh, in that particular case, uh, there is a problem in the Fourier transform in the sense that this sum that we have to evaluate from minus infinity to the infinity doesn't converge uh, and doesn't converge pointwise to be precise. However, since this is such an important signal, it's valuable to have a notion of what the transform of it is, even though this sum doesn't converge. So the way to handle this is instead to look at the inverse transform or just postulate a transform. So we see that if uh, the signal happens to be a pulse train of delta pulses at this particular frequency and at plus one of this frequency, minus one of this frequency. This of course has to be uh, this case because the Fourier transform has to be periodic. Then we see that if we evaluate the inverse transform over an interval that contains one of these pulses, so for instance minus one half to one half or zero to one, what will come out of the inverse transform is exactly this uh, signal of interest, which is why we can safely say that the transform of this signal is equal to this pulse stream. Uh, we can do the same thing if we're not interested in working with uh, real valued uh, or complex valued exponentials. If we look at the cosine function, for instance, we can represent that in terms of a transform with two frequencies, one at the negative normalized frequency of the cosine and one at the positive normalized frequency. And in the same way we can show that if you evaluate uh, this integral from 0 to 1, what will result is the cosine function. Now, um, since we will always be working with uh, periodic signals, it's very convenient to just specify uh, the transform over a range uh, of period 1. So in this case minus 1 half to 1 half. And the reason for doing that is, of course, that we don't have to deal with the infinite sum, right? But it's important to remember that even if we do it like this, uh, we only tell you what, or we only specify what the function is within this range. And we can work out what the function has to be outside of this range by just uh, using the periodic extension. We just saw what the discrete time Fourier transform of the cosine function was. But what is the discrete time Fourier transform of the sine function? where we have a sine function with a normalized frequency within the range minus one half to one half, and we evaluate the discrete time Fourier transform in the same range. Will it be one half times the sum of two direct pulses, one at nu naught and one at minus nu naught? Uh, 
will it be one half times the difference between two uh, direct pulses, one at nil naught and one at minus nil naught, or it will it be one over two times the imaginary number times this difference? Well, the answer to the question lies in this way of writing the sine function, namely as this difference between two complex exponentials divided by 2j. And we can easily see that if we take answer number 3 and we plug it into the inverse transform, the way that these direct pulses will work is that they will single out the frequencies at nil naught and minus nil naught, and as we divide that by 2 over j, we can use this formula to get back at the sine function. So option number 3 is the correct answer to the question. So far we have looked at the definition of the discrete time Fourier transform, some of its properties and also some examples. Uh, but in order to motivate the usefulness of the transform and try to motivate why we introduced it in the first place, it's illustrative to consider a linear and time invariant system or an LTI system. So for an LTI system we have the property that if we give given an input signal x of n then the output will simply be the input convolved with a function h of n which you know as the impulse response of this system. So from this relation we can prove that if the input is a pure sinusoid then the output uh, y of n will simply be a phase shifted and amplitude changed version of this sinusoid and if we're working with the uh, complex valued sinusoid this is am this amounts only to the multiplication with a complex number which we call h of nil zero here. So h of nil zero is nothing other than the discrete Fourier transform of the impulse response h of n evaluated at this frequency nil zero. So if we transfer this property to an arbitrary signal x of n, we know that this arbitrary signal can be written as an integral of a weight, set of weighted complex sinusoids. And due to the linearity property, we can analyze what happened to each of these sinusoids as they pass through the system, namely that they gave phase changed and amplitude changed by h of ni at this particular frequency. And then the output is simply given by the same weighted sum of phase and amplitude changed sinusoids. So if we look at this formula, we see that this is nothing other than the inverse transform for the output sequence, which tells us that the output sequence, or that its Fourier transform, to be more precise, is just the Fourier transform of the input multiplied by the Fourier transform of the impulse response, or the frequency response of the system. So this gives us two different ways of looking at the LTI system. So one way of looking at them is in the time domain, where we have this convolution property that the output is given by the impulse response convolved with the input signal. But we could also say that the Fourier transform of the output is given by the Fourier transform of the impulse response or the frequency, uh, trans frequency response of the system multiplied by the Fourier transform of the input. And this is typically much more illustrative when we try to understand what type of properties the system have. And this is one of the main reasons for introducing the discrete time Fourier transform. So we looked at the discrete time Fourier transform, which is a transform that takes an infinite length sequence x of n and maps it into a periodic function x of ni with period 1. So x of ni here is thought of as the frequency content of x of n at the particular normalized frequency. And the reason that the transform is periodic with period 1 is this aliasing property, which tells us that two different sinusoids at different frequencies cannot be told apart if the frequencies are separated by an integer number. And this is an explicit property of working with discrete time signals. We also argue that the DFT is an important tool for analyzing linear and time invariant systems. And the main reason for this is that the DFT transforms this somewhat complicated convolution operation into a much simpler multiplicative operation in the frequency domain.